struggling to understand potassium imbalances? Well, look no further, because in today's video, we break down everything you need to know about hyperkalemia. Hey, what's up you guys, and welcome back to my channel. So today we talk about the pathophysiology, symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment of hyperkalemia. I give you the important information that's often tested on while helping you understand why certain signs and symptoms occur. So if you're pumped, grab some coffee and let's get started. So body fluids are divided between the intracellular and the extracellular fluid compartments. The intracellular fluid compartment includes all the fluid that's inside the cell. And the extracellular fluid compartment includes all the fluid that's outside the cell. And this is fluid that's in the tissues, and this we call interstitial, and the fluid that's in the bloodstream. The extracellular fluid compartment is high in things like sodium and chloride, and the intracellular fluid compartment is high in things like potassium, and it has a moderate amount of magnesium in it. 98% of body potassium is stored inside the cell, which only leaves about 2% to the extracellular fluid. And this means that the bloodstream will have a low amount of potassium in it. So if we take the word hyperkalemia and we break it down, hyper means high, cal is the prefix for potassium, and emia means blood. So hyperkalemia therefore is a high blood potassium level. Normal blood potassium is a range between 3.5 and 5 milliequivalents per liter. So hyperkalemia, therefore, is a blood potassium level of greater than 5. So potassium is needed to maintain the resting membrane potential of nerve and muscle cells, and it also plays a role in acid-base balance. So there are two pumps that regulate potassium on a cellular level, and these are the sodium-potassium ATPase and the hydrogen potassium ATPase. And these pumps are found both in cell membranes and in the kidneys. So the sodium potassium pump moves two potassium ions into the cell for every three sodium ions that it takes out of the cell. And the hydrogen potassium pump moves potassium and hydrogen in opposite directions. And unlike the sodium potassium pump, the hydrogen pump can move potassium either into the cell or out of the cell, but whichever way it's moving potassium, hydrogen has to go in the opposite direction. But on a macro level, potassium is excreted through the kidneys, and the kidneys excrete 90% of potassium through the GI tract and through the sweat. And you'll want to keep these routes in mind when we start to talk about the causes of hyperkalemia. So the causes of hyperkalemia can be broken down into an increased intake of potassium, a decreased loss of potassium, and a shift of potassium from the intracellular to the extracellular fluid. So an increased intake of potassium can be from oral sources, or a result of a rapid IV infusion of potassium. And this has to be mentioned, but it is definitely not one of the most common causes. And an increased oral intake of potassium does not usually cause hyperkalemia because your body has mechanisms in place to excrete extra potassium. So decreased excretion of potassium is among the most common causes of hyperkalemia. And renal failure is the most prevalent cause of elevated potassium levels. And a note here, but chronic hyperkalemia is almost always associated with chronic kidney disease. Other causes of decreased potassium excretion include potassium sparing diuretics. And this might seem counterintuitive because we saw that diuretics caused low potassium levels, but the key word here is potassium sparing. Potassium sparing diuretics hold on to potassium while allowing fluid excretion. And the most common potassium sparing diuretic I can think of is spironolactone. 
Adrenal insufficiency can also cause decreased excretion of potassium. Remember from a previous lecture that aldosterone is released from the adrenal cortex. And aldosterone caused the reabsorption of sodium and the excretion of potassium. But if we have an adrenal insufficiency, such as occurs in Addison's disease, then our adrenal gland is not working and we cannot secrete aldosterone, which means we can't excrete potassium. And so potassium will build up in our body. The last cause I want to talk about is the movement of potassium from the intracellular space to the extracellular space. So we mentioned previously that the intracellular space houses the majority of body potassium. Therefore, anything that actually damages tissues can cause potassium to leak out of cells and into the bloodstream. And crush injuries are an example of this. Crush injuries damage cells and allow potassium to escape into the blood. So an acidosis can actually cause potassium to shift out of cells as well. In an acidosis, we have high hydrogen ions in our blood. Because of this, the body tries to compensate and move hydrogen ions from the blood into the cell. And it does this by way of the potassium hydrogen pump. And because this pump moves hydrogen and potassium in opposite directions, when the body moves hydrogen ions into the cell, it has to take potassium ions out of the cell and move them to the bloodstream. And this will increase our blood potassium levels. So the signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia result from the fact that potassium plays a huge role in action potentials and muscle function. So in a normal cell, we have a normal resting membrane potential. And in muscle cells, it's around negative 70 millivolts. In order for an action potential to occur, a stimulus has to come along and cause the cell to depolarize enough to meet threshold. And once threshold has been met, an action potential occurs. And action potentials in muscle cells equal muscle contraction. Hyperkalemia, however, depolarizes the resting membrane potential. It moves it closer to threshold. So this means that now a smaller stimulus can cause threshold to be reached and therefore can cause an action potential. And the fact that a smaller stimulus can now cause an action potential and thus muscle contraction manifests as muscle hyperactivity. If you want more information on how hyperkalemia depolarizes a cell, then comment down below. But for now, we're moving on. So just remember, high potassium, higher resting membrane potential. In the gastrointestinal tract, this makes smooth muscle hyperexcitable. So we will have things like increased motility, hyperactive bowel sounds, and diarrhea. In the neuromuscular system, hyperactive muscles lead to muscle twitching, muscle cramps, and paresthesias at first. However, as blood potassium levels increase to dangerously high levels, sustained muscle contraction can occur. As part of the repolarization phase of an action potential, potassium needs to be able to leave the cell. In muscle cells, repolarization equals relaxation. And in a normal cell, potassium leaves no problem. But in hyperkalemia, we have all this extra potassium outside the cell. So this ruins our concentration gradient and potassium will not leave the cell as easily. As potassium grows to dangerously high levels, potassium cannot leave the cell really at all. And this means that the cell will not relax. And this causes sustained muscle contraction, which we call tetany. And this is true not only of skeletal muscles, and remember your diaphragm is a skeletal muscle, but it's also true of cardiac muscle. So keep this in mind when we start to talk about the dangerous signs of hyperkalemia. In the respiratory system, severe hyperkalemia will lead to muscle weakness and paralysis of the diaphragm, which will cause respiratory failure. In the cardiovascular system, depolarization of the resting membrane potential of myocardial cells and of pacemaker cells 
makes the firing of these cells increasingly likely. And if cells are contracting every which way, whenever they want, that leads to dysrhythmias. And as potassium levels get increasingly high, lethal dysrhythmias can lead to cardiac arrest. And this is why potassium chloride injections are used to enact the death penalty, because they stop the heart. So for the diagnosis of hyperkalemia, you'll just want to draw a metabolic panel and see that the potassium level is greater than five. Additionally, you will want to complete an EKG. And the EKG for hyperkalemia will look opposite to that for hypokalemia. And this is an NCLEX topic, so get ready. Hyperkalemia will cause flat P waves, prolonged PR intervals, a widened QRS and peaked T waves. Of these, the peaked T waves are probably the most important and most common sign. Now the pathology of these signs is very complicated and extensive, so we won't go into that here. But in order to remember the T wave, I just think high potassium, high T wave. In an emergent situation, IV calcium can be given to combat membrane excitability, but this only lasts for about 15 to 30 minutes. So you need to be working on other treatment modalities like giving IV insulin to shift potassium into the cells. This, however, is accompanied by dextrose administration so as not to cause hypoglycemia. Beta agonists like continuous albuterol nebulizers can be given to also shift potassium into the cells. And the reason that we give albuterol and insulin is because these medications increase the activity of the sodium potassium pump, which brings potassium into the cell. If renal function is not impaired, you can give loop or thiazide diuretics to increase potassium excretion. If renal function is impaired, you can give k orally or rectally to enhance gastrointestinal excretion of potassium, but always make sure you have active bowel sounds before you do this. And then restrict oral potassium and place your patient on telemetry. Any potassium patient, hypo or hyperkalemic, will always be on telemetry because of the way that potassium affects the heart. Hey guys, welcome back. If you have any questions, be sure to post them in the comments below. And if you got value out of this video, give it a big thumbs up. Share it with a friend that needs to know about hyperkalemia and click right here for more fluid and electrolyte videos. Otherwise, subscribe for more nursing content and I'll see you guys next week.